Welcome everybody, this is How to English, Teach and Learn with Gav and Em. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal and references will be given when necessary. Em, welcome to the show, episode 17, Newbie with Isa. And how long ago were you a newbie, Gav? Em, it feels like donkey's years since I first stepped my big toe into the classroom. Sorry, I think you dip your big toe in. You don't step your big toe. No, I stepped into the classroom. I dipped my big toe into the field of language teaching. And it was donkey's years ago. Yes. Right. Yeah, feels like a lifetime ago for me too. I think we should revisit those days in today's episode, Em. Dig into that little box that you've filed away in your head and let's rekindle those feelings, how it was to be new, how it was to start the teaching journey. And obviously some of our followers will be starting that journey. Some of them will be well into that journey and some of them may be over that journey and maybe into something else instead. But I still think it's a nice idea to reflect sometimes and also perhaps support the newbies out there too. The newcomers to the industry. Plus, M, remember we're always reinventing ourselves as teachers, so there's always something new. You're never at the end of that learning journey. Exactly right, Gav. And there may be things you can learn from newbies. I agree. And to get the ball rolling, M, let's listen to a newbie. This week's guest, M, is Isa, who will share her story of becoming a teacher. We will hear how her journey began from people telling her, Isa, you should become a teacher. And then finally, through her teacher training in detail, which I think could be really interesting for our followers, then she discusses the opportunities that she's seeking to grow her student base. Plus, she'll mention some tools that she uses in her classroom or online. You can find Isa on Instagram. If you look for Isa underscore English underscore lessons, there you can find tense reviews, vocabulary, practice and a chance to book English lessons. Hi, Gavin M. Thank you so much for inviting me. It is a pleasure to be your guest today. I have just recently done the CELTA course in Lisbon, Portugal, and I got my qualification to finally be an English teacher. My native language is Portuguese because I'm Brazilian, but I learned English as a child because I studied at an international school from the ages of 11 to 14. But during my school years, I had these experiences helping friends out with their English homework and writing essays, and they would always mention that I was just great at explaining things in a clear way. And I was always a very dedicated student, so I thought, why not become a teacher? I love sitting down, helping people out, and everyone had been telling me for a while that I might just have what it takes to do it. So I started the course this year in July, and it was a very intense one-month experience, but it was completely worth it. I would always get home with that feeling of, I learned something new, I helped my students learn something as well, and it was just so gratifying. In case anyone out there is interested in doing a CELTA course, our days were basically divided into two parts. So in the morning we would teach, in the afternoon we would learn. So for the teaching part, we would have a group of students that knew that we were practicing to be new teachers. They were aware of it. And we were just thrown at the deep end. We started teaching as soon as the course started. And for me, I did um, B2 students in the first half of the course. And then I taught A2 students for the second half of the course. Then in the afternoon, we would have the input sessions to learn teaching techniques. Uh, Well, now I'm a newly qualified teacher. And I must say, it isn't easy. But during the course, I did get a lot of tips and support from my tutors on how to get started. I've already applied for a couple of jobs at English schools, but I'm also looking into giving online lessons. Though I must say the focus of the CELTA course is classroom management. 
So I would much prefer to also work at an English school and not only remotely. But I think doing both at the start is the ideal plan for any new teacher. In the course, we did quickly go through online teaching tools and techniques, but only at the very end. So I'm applying those right now and using Google Classroom, for example, for my tasks and homework, any type of communication that I need to have with my students. And then I use Google Meet for the lessons themselves. I usually plan the lessons on Word and then I make a nice PowerPoint presentation. And if it's not um, remote lessons, I also make handouts. But you can find a lot of inspiration for tasks on the internet and content ideas on websites such as Pinterest, for example. At the end, um, for the freer practice, um, if it is an online lesson, I like to do a game or something that I make on WordWall or I use Quizlet to make the experience even more fun and engaging for the students. And I think it also helps them fixate any new information from the lesson. I think that the hardest part for a new teacher is the amount of lesson planning and for me especially, predicting what problems students might face during the lesson. I'm also practicing a lot my ability to make the lessons even more student-centered. I think that's something we can always improve. I guess that comes with experience though, which is what I'm searching for right now. And my tip for any new teachers is to not be afraid of putting yourself out there. There are many websites to promote your work on. And I'm not the best with social media, but I am learning and slowly I'm finding new students for myself. So just make yourself a profile on whatever platform you feel more comfortable with and slowly students will find you. I also made a business card once in case I'm out on the street and I meet people who are interested in lessons, but I think the internet is the best way to find students. It is an option though, and sometimes in person the student gets you know, your vibe, and then they get, they see how you're like and how well you can speak and they start to trust that you know what you're doing as a teacher. If you'd like to ask any questions or book a lesson yourself, feel free to contact me on my Instagram. It is at Isa underscore English underscore lessons. And thank you so much for listening. I hope I was able to help some new teachers out there. And thanks again, Gavin M. Thank you very much, Isa. And I feel like your experience was very similar to my experience. It was very similar to mine too, even to the point that I made some business cards and I always had them in my back pocket, although I can't remember giving any to anybody. But I was sure if I did meet someone, I was prepared, Em. I agree. And now I guess, yeah, Isa's point about everything's online so it's really good to get a page where people can check out your qualifications, check out what you can offer, maybe have a little demo video on there as well might be good. But definitely, I think if you're not online, you're going to miss out on a lot of students. I agree. Create that online profile for your potential students to visit. And Issa's experience of CELTA was so much like mine, those words that she was using, like intensive and overwhelming, I completely agree. It was a lot of information in a very short time. But I also loved the same things that Issa loved. I loved learning and, and every day you felt like you'd done something, you've achieved something. It was a really amazing experience. It was a non-stop educational experience. For more information on Gav and M's experience of the CELTA, you can visit Season 1's Episode 41 titled... What I Got From The CELTA. Where we talk about all of these things in detail. That was a good one. As I mentioned, M, even for experienced teachers, we're constantly reinventing ourselves as teachers whether that's learning how to teach business English or groups, individuals, maybe you've got an intensive course, maybe you're just starting your online teaching, you might be doing some ESP. What's that? English for specific purposes. The list is kind of endless. And will continue to grow. That's the great thing about the industry. It will keep changing. And then there's all those new teaching techniques that you might encounter Maybe you're reading books on teaching, doing some training, attending a teaching conference. 
When I look back, Gav, I do wonder how I managed to learn everything, teach at the same time, do all my lesson planning. It was a lot. So I think Issa's point about how it can be a bit much at the beginning, I very much remember that feeling. And how you brought all of those new skills, all of that knowledge into your teaching without being overwhelmed and without feeling inadequate when you look around and see all these incredibly successful teachers and think, how do they keep all of that information in their heads while they're in front of their class? Yeah, I couldn't really do that. I couldn't feel confident. I felt very overwhelmed and very inferior for a very long time. So it is normal for newbies to have that feeling and it's good to know other people are feeling it too. Em, your journey as a teacher could start anywhere. As Issa mentioned, you're interested in teaching other people or helping, supporting others to learn something. You might have interest in foreign languages. You may love reading, maybe poetry. It could be travel that takes your interest and also be interested in meeting people from all over the world, having a shared language to learn about their culture, how it's similar or different to yours. Language teaching is a great key to travel and exploring new countries and cultures. As well as lots of other things, Gav. Em, let's zero in on some of our own experiences. Maybe you can tell us about your first one-to-one class. Can I be honest? Please be honest. I actually don't remember the first one-to-one student I ever had. You don't remember? Whoever that is, I really am sorry. They're probably not listening, don't worry. But I felt like (laughs) it was all a bit of a blur. So I do remember groups, but one-to-ones are hard. The first six months? Yeah, I was thinking of maybe one that comes to mind in the early days, let's say. And I think I'd had a lot of groups up till then. So you started with groups? Yeah, I'd had a lot of group lessons. And And you became a bit more confident with groups and thought, okay, I kind of know where I am with groups. Yeah, so I think maybe six months in, I had a one-to-one and I went in thinking the same mindset as I would with a group. I had my lesson plan. I had all my timings organised. I had my activities ready and I sat down. And I introduced myself and I did the needs analysis. And then the student just asked me if I could check her emails and tell her if her spelling and grammar was okay. Was that on your lesson plan? No, it wasn't, funnily enough. And I thought, this isn't the lesson plan. This wasn't what I had in mind. This is totally not my lesson. This is something else. She's completely sabotaged my idea. Why is the student not doing what I'm telling them to do? Because I'm the teacher and they're the student, so they need to follow my plan. That was my idea. I am the teacher. She's going to look to me for all the input. and. Well, you have all the wisdom, Em. Yeah, well, that was my very naive idea. And I guess I was completely off guard and I felt very lost in that lesson because I have kept thinking I've got to get back to what I had in mind and I've got to get back to the plan and this isn't the right thing to be doing. Which you were able to do with your group classes that you were much more confident with? I wouldn't go that far, but I had more, let's say, control of the group classes. And then it occurred to me that, yeah, that's the difference. A group class is a kind of homogenous blob of people that you sort of end up putting into a a sheep kind of situation where everybody's doing the same thing. But when you get a one-to-one, you are literally just dealing with one person and their needs and what they want. And if you have someone who's quite confident, they will take over. And that's what happened. And I felt like that wasn't the right thing. But in retrospect, Gav, it was totally fine. And she knew what she wanted and she was very clear about what she wanted. And I think that was a good thing. But from my newbie perspective, I thought, firstly, I'm not doing my job. Secondly, she's going to get to the end and say, well, I didn't learn anything. Thirdly, I'll get bad feedback because I'm not teaching her anything, you know, book-like. And I was having these thoughts constantly during the lesson. Doubt, doubt, doubt. So how do you write this into your lesson plan? Do you just have a big space and it says, let the student take over? (laughs) I think... I quickly learned that that lesson and that student was not going to be the traditional idea of what I thought a lesson should be anyway. So it wasn't a good match between the lesson plan and the student. Exactly. 
So I guess that's what you do on the needs analysis. You just have an open mind and then you adapt accordingly. But I went in with a lesson plan thinking this person is going to need to have something structured and it wasn't the case. Well, that kind of makes sense for every first lesson where you should have a plan and then, as you said, be ready to adapt, be ready to change depending on the personality of the student, depending on their expectations. Yeah, I think I had the idea that the needs analysis was a kind of formality to go through and I wasn't really paying attention. Maybe she did tell me what she wanted, but I was very much on the back foot for most of the beginning of those classes, I think, because I had a preconceived idea, which isn't always good. And you took that wisdom into your further one-to-one classes and thought, ah, now I'm more ready, more prepared for something different to what's on my lesson plan for the next one-to-one class. Absolutely. And I think now I realise the good thing and the bad thing about teaching one-to-ones is the same thing. It's not predictable. It's different every time. The student's needs are really the focus. And the teacher can really analyse those needs because there aren't any other students. So you can really focus on what that one person wants and their learning style. But at the beginning, that was a negative thing. I felt like there's far too much here to deal with and I can't possibly know all this. And how can I adapt every time? And if I've got 10 one-to-ones, that is overwhelming. I think that word's going to come up a lot in this episode. (laughs) But now I think that's the good thing about one-to-ones. The variety, the amazing difference that people have, it's fantastic. And you don't have to achieve complete success in that first or even the second or even the third lesson with that one-to-one. It will take you time to understand what the student wants, to react correctly in each situation during the lesson, and it will just take time. Yeah, it's, I think, a bit more of a relationship builder. Obviously, you have that with groups, but with a one-to-one, you really have got to work out your relationship. So, Gav, what about your first group lesson? Can you tell me about that? Well, that was a long time ago. I think it was a group of 12-year-olds. Oh. And the... What's the opposite of highlight, Em? Low light. Is it low light? (laughs) No, um, probably um, lowest point. The lowest point in the lesson, I think, was when one of the children was crawling across the desks at the back of the classroom. But I thought, as long as they don't hurt themselves, this will be a successful lesson. Mm, That sounds like a newbie attitude, doesn't it? That's like, I'm not in control of this at all. Is that how you felt? Well, I was... Definitely a newbie, and I was thinking like a newbie, but I also thought there's only so much control I have over this group of young people, and I'm not going to shout, I'm not going to pull the sweets out, I'm not going to (laughs) make them feel bad beyond what's normal. I simply said, please sit down, join the other students, and um, obviously if that doesn't work, you just wait until the bell goes and then it's over. I think anyone who teaches kids would be shouting at you, no, Gav, this is not classroom management for children. You can't just sit back and hope it all works out, I think. (laughs) That may have been your first mistake. First and nearly last experience of teaching young people. But after some good chats with the young people, we came to a compromise and said, let's play some games, let's do some activities. They got to know me, I got to know them, and we were all friends by the end of it. So don't worry, Em. And a lot of teaching and learning happened, I guess? It did. It was fairly successful. There were no tears. I guess that is quite a hard age, 12. I think that is the time where you need to give a bit and take a bit and get, yeah, like a contract going of what do you want, what do I want. So that's probably a good strategy. In hindsight, Gav, could you have planned or done anything different to make your first lesson go a bit better? No. (laughs) You're very confident, really? (laughs) Probably. Yes. I should have watched other teachers teaching their classes of young people and seen some of the techniques that worked. I could have planned my lesson a bit better and 
predicted some of the problems we might have had when they lost interest, they were bored, they wanted to do something else. Climb on the table. Fitted all of that into my lesson plan, except for the table climbing. (laughs) And maybe even put some little breaks in there, because I think young people need some breaks. Maybe they don't want such intensive lessons. So, Mm. yeah, there were lots of considerations now in hindsight that I could have thought about. Mm. Okay. Em, would you like a coffee? Thanks, Gav, but you know I only drink tea. Oh, yeah. Well, that could be arranged. Oh? Followers, if you're enjoying listening, watching or reading Gav and Em's How to English pod, visit coffee.com forward slash how to English pod. That's coffee, K-O dash F-I dot com forward slash how to English pod. And it would be lovely if you bought us a coffee or a tea to show us support. And you could even get a mention on our show if you'd like. Em, reflecting again on your newbie status when back in the day you were a fresh young teacher. (laughs) Give us an example of a teaching technique that you added to your very fine repository. I think the word exploitation didn't really mean what I thought it meant at the beginning. So I knew about this word. I learned it in CELTA to exploit the materials. But I don't think I actually adopted it and used it until maybe 10 years in. Really? So what does exploiting materials mean for you? It means making the most of what's going well. It means if a student or group is talking about something, that they're enjoying it, keep it going, maybe build up on that topic, get more vocabulary going, think about the grammar. You can really, and I remember this so well, my first week teaching, and one of the experienced teachers showed me an exercise and said, yeah, use this in the class. You'll love it. You can get an hour and a half out of that. No problem. Really? And I, I just looked at it and thought, but that's like a six sentence gap fill exercise. Like what, what possible? Ex- <laughs> what can I do with that? That's, that's a five minute exercise. But now as I look back, I see what he was talking about. It was a travel topic and so many things were in there that you could talk about not just the word in the gap or whatever it was you could talk about all the points in the sentences and it does last 90 minutes it's just having the confidence and getting your students comfortable with it and then you can really get the most out of it and get the most out of your students exactly And I don't know, some people may say that's dragging it out and it's not going to get through the syllabus. And I don't know if that may be a fair point too. But I think that I've realised that communication that is authentic and real is often a bit more of an extended, deeper dive into something. It's not just, right, bish, bash, bosh, let's do all these different exercises, get through them. That can be good. But definitely exploiting things for me means getting really into the... Nitty gritty. Thank you, Gav. That is exactly the right word. Getting into the nitty gritty. And it gets more memorable that way. Students come away, I think, thinking I had a really good deep conversation about something. It wasn't all just surface level. And it becomes memorable. Yeah, that's what I said. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And especially, as I mentioned, exploiting the students, the best resource... Exploiting the students, I'm not sure about that, but... And especially remembering exploiting the knowledge of your students, the experiences of your students, because that is the biggest source of information. The students in front of you, not necessarily that book that's in front of everybody, but although the books can be very useful and you may be expected to go through the books, but remember to keep personalising it, Keep asking your students, what do you think? What are your experiences? How do you understand this? Yes, bravo. (laughs) Definitely, Gav. (laughs) That's it. Can you tell us about a skill that you've learned, Gav, that was essential to you when you were a newbie? One thing that stayed in my mind, M, is that when planning a lesson, have a student in mind. Mm. which is kind of obvious if it's a one-to-one because it will be the shoot. (laughs) 
But if it's a group, try to think about a middle level student, maybe one that may find comprehension slightly more difficult. Somebody from that group or a generic person? Probably from that group. But then remember, you can use that lesson plan again with another group, hopefully. So you're thinking of only one student or you're then thinking and applying it to different students from different classes? Think of one student in a group, one that may be between the upper and the lower students. Think about a student who takes slightly longer to understand something which will force you as the teacher to prepare a lesson that is very, very clear. Mm. Think about how that student would react to that lesson, to each activity within your lesson plan. Mm. That, I think, was one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given. I think that is teaching gold. And I would actually expand on that a little bit now. I'm a bit more experienced. I do what you are saying, but I actually do apply it to more than one. So I think about maybe the highest one and the lowest one. And I think, what would that lesson be like for those two students there is a caveat go on you could also plan it for the lowest student in the group but then during the lesson you have to be aware of micro teaching the highest Mm. level student which is why i go back to thinking now about both higher and lower how could you plan a lesson for both higher and lower students emma i cannot comprehend it Well, that is what you said. You have to think about how you're going to micro teach or upgrade or how you're going to make it a bit more simple for the lower level. But this comes with experience. So I think you're right about the beginning. Maybe just think about the one student in the middle somewhere. And then as you get through a bit more training and a bit more teaching, you can think of it from more of a holistic point of view. And it's not just about the level of learning. Remember the level of understanding are you presenting the language in a way that everyone will understand yeah just because you understand it doesn't mean that they're going to understand it so think about a student who maybe has challenged you or is challenged by the way that you teach think about how can you make this language more accessible to them very good and that isn't in the teachers books when you plan your lessons i remember the teachers books were great really informative loads of grammar tips, how to present activities, great activities. But it didn't ever really say, consider the person in you know this seat and think about it from their point of view. It was always just student. That would be a great training session. Em, on that topic, can you think of a training session that really helped your teaching that you can pass on to our newbie followers? Maybe it continues quite well from what we were just talking about, because I remember very well at the beginning of my teaching career, having a lot of things in my head, going to every class, stressing, thinking about all the plans I had. So I had all of this on my plate. And then I went to a training session that was all about dyslexia and dysgraphia. And I thought, oh, I haven't even considered people affected by this. So it was a, another shift in my perspective of how to plan a lesson and how to think about a lesson. And it was overwhelming again because I thought, well, how do I take that on as well? I've got so much going on. But of course, it's so important. We have to think about every person's perspective. And it's really bad if we don't think that there will be people in our classes with different learning styles and different learning abilities. That is certainly a consideration that we need to take on board. So what did you do? I thought about it and I still think about it now. I think it's just being aware, aware of it is just uh, one of those milestone moments in teaching that I thought, ah, yeah, I haven't really thought about that before. Mm -hmm. That's a really big one. Because you get to a point you think, well, I must have met every single challenge there is for teaching. Yeah, but you shouldn't be complacent. There is so much to learn. And for you, Gav, is there a training session that stands out in your mind? I do remember a training session. I remember that I was really inspired by a training course I was doing when the trainee teachers were asked about a teaching experience they'd had recently, teaching a new word in class and how the teacher went about teaching it, which we did and saw 
how different teachers dealt with the situation. It was fascinating to see how each teacher found creative ways to teach the new word to the group. And this whole activity could be done with your students. For example, the teacher asks the class if any student has learned any new words and then as a group learn those new words through reflection and ultimately production. Maybe a role play or students creating example sentences or simply having a discussion around the new word in its context. So both the teachers in the training and the students in the lesson would learn a word in a different way through a different method and you can really get into what worked and what didn't work and maybe next week which ones do we remember and why and if that technique was the best one and oh that's nice. Exactly. As teachers, we may find some teaching techniques work. As students, we learn and we express these ideas differently. So they're both kind of reflecting each other. It was really interesting. Um, Let me give you an example. A student may mention that they learnt the word steeple. Yeah. Where would they encounter that word, Em? Maybe they were on a tour of a church or they were watching a documentary on their favourite city and the skyline was mentioned and the word steeple just came up naturally. Mm. This could lead to the student describing their own skyline to their partner or class or in writing on their own town or city. Or maybe the teacher draws a church for the students to identify each part. Em, we're going to return to this at the end of the show. Return to steeple, you mean? Hmm. Okay, Gav. What I love about my job, Gav, is that I was a newbie and now I'm not a newbie. But as you said, we're all still learning. And it's lovely to think that now I have got the ability to not just teach my students, but to teach other teachers In an informal way between teacher and teacher. Yeah, I'm not a teacher trainer, but we get to give our knowledge and our experiences and just connect to other teachers in that way. And I love that. We've talked about it in previous episodes, that staff room environment where you are giving your help, your knowledge, your experience, tips to other teachers, newbie or not newbie. There are so many gems of wisdom. When I look back on my first couple of years as a teacher, I remember so many things that people told me. And I think I've got some now that I would add to that that I've discovered myself. That is so cool. And this is a great opportunity for us to share these gems with our newbies, our experienced teachers, everybody. Absolutely, Gav. I've made a list. Have you made a list? I did make a couple of notes. And before you tell us your first gem, should we do a little tune? You want a new tune? Yeah, ready? Teachers gems. Yeah, if you want. Gems with M. And Gav. And Gav. Okay. So gem number one, don't make it up. (laughs) I always make it up. No, no, no. If you don't know the answer, just say you don't know. Because it does come back to you and bite you on the bum. It will come back to you. Students have got great memories. They'll come back to you next week and say, you know, you said this thing. That's not true. I Googled it. or And they actually Google it in the lessons now anyway. So don't lie. Don't make it up if it's about grammar, if it's about word meaning, if it's about, I don't know, any general knowledge thing. Just don't pretend you know if you don't. It's not a problem if you don't know. It's best to be honest. I absolutely agree. And the advantage is you can pull your phone out if that's appropriate in that context and just double check and say to the student, well, it's something that I'm not familiar with. This is new to me. Yeah. Or the classic... We'll look at that next week. Yeah. It's better to say I'll check it out than to lie and make it up and then somebody come back and say you were wrong. Gem two. The lesson will be over in 60 minutes. Or, or 90 minutes. Or 90 minutes. <laughs> it it might, will be yeah. over. I think that's... It might be over in 60 minutes if you walk out. And it should have been. <laughs> but you mean it will end. The lesson will end. It may feel infinite when you're in the middle of it, but it will end. It may be a disaster. It may be a total success. But it will end. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, I think you've got actually a similar one to me, which is just remember it's only an English lesson. So I know that sounds really negative, but, you know, if it goes badly, 
or if you're not having a good time or if your students are not enjoying it or if you feel like it's just a bad lesson, it's only a lesson. You know, it's not life and death. It's not going to be remembered forever in time and memorial. So put it in perspective, people. It's an English lesson. Maybe the most important thing in your day, but for your students, it may just be a little extra thing. It may be the most important thing in their day, but hey, it's a lesson. That's it. Was that Gem 3? Well, it was sort of the same as yours, I think. Gem, Gem, Gem 2, 2. slash 1. 3. Okay, 2.1. Gem 3. How can the teacher talk less and the student produce more language, whether it's speaking, writing, whatever it is? Just remember, how can your students be producing more than you? That's the question that I pose to myself mm. before the lesson, during the lesson, after the lesson. I nice. think, how could I have done that better? Nice. So always have that question in your head. I think that's a very good gem. I have like a little level that goes up and I think, oh, no, I've been talking loads and loads. I've been explaining this grammar too long. I've been talking about this word too long. I've been telling this story for far too long. And I think, right, I need to switch off. I need to engage the students, mm. get them talking, get them writing, whatever it is, get them focused on production as much as enjoying listening yeah. or whatever. Really good. Really, really good. I agree with what you've said about production. But I also think you have to remember to teach it to them or they have to learn it. So this may seem obvious. You're a teacher. They're a learner. Of course, they're going to learn just because they're in a room with a book. They're going to learn. But that's just not true. And I think I realized quite far into my first year teaching when one of my colleagues who was a co-teacher with me for one course, he was doing an alternate day, came to me one day and just said, they didn't know it, that thing you were supposed to teach them yesterday. They didn't know it. And this was a revelation. I thought, oh, but I went in there. I wrote things on the board. They were looking at the pages. I set them homework. But they don't know it. So as much as it sounds easy, you have to check they are learning it and you have to go through it in a way that means they are learning it in order for them to then produce it. It does sound easy. It sounds so obvious. How can they not be learning it simply because I'm showing it to them? But you're right. And you do need to test them on that the next week or the next lesson. Which is where your production thing comes in. You know, yes, yes, go through it with them in the book, on the board, whatever way you want to teach it, but then make them produce it so you can check they know it. So I think your gem and my gem together, it's more effective. Gem five, be supportive, empathetic, and sensitive. Mm, your gem's a bit like my gem, which is remember everybody has a different perspective. Mm. Do you think that goes together? Em, all of these things are working together. The teacher needs to be so aware of the student, sensitive to their emotions, to their reactions, to their learning styles, absorption of the language, of the awareness of their engagement. There's so much to consider as a teacher, whether you're looking at a group of people, how could you possibly be aware of what's happening there? Mm. Or to this one-to-one, -one, oh, there's so much to think about. Yeah, but you're right. Sensitivity, empathy, looking at it from other people's point of views, as I'd said, that is fundamental. You cannot just go in and think that it's going to work because you think it's going to work. You have to see what's happening. You have to listen to what people are saying. Respond accordingly. Gem six. It won't go any better if you're stressed. Does it not? No, doesn't help. Really doesn't help. You've got to let that one go. Just tell yourself, doesn't help if I'm stressed. Mm, it's very hard to turn stress off though, Em. It is, and as a newbie, I couldn't. But I had to just keep telling myself. Eventually, it got better. And I think when experienced teachers tell you that, you have to believe them because it's true. It does get better. It will be easier. And getting stressed about it isn't going to help. Mm -hmm. When does stress ever help us, Em? I don't know. I can't think of a good example. So mm, hard to relax, but you have to try. It's hard to say to somebody, don't stress. Yeah. Well, it's easy to say, but it's <laughs> difficult to not stress. I don't know if that would be helpful, don't stress. I think just tell people, I understand why you're stressed. I was stressed. It is stressful. 
but it will get easier. Go back to our previous gem, which was, it'll be over soon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just remember that. Gem seven. This is my last gem, M. Give the students time to reflect. Oh, very good, Gem. Teachers have to be patient. Don't be scared of silence. That is a very good tip. And don't think, as you previously said, that you've shown the student that you've taught this thing, that they now understand it, because it simply might not be the case. You may have to return to it many times in many different ways, in many different contexts, until the student can really learn that thing. Mm-hmm. And my last gem, Gav, is gem eight, and that is remember the goals. Remember your students' goals. Remember why they are there, what you're doing. You can go off track a bit perhaps, but really focus on what it is, the end result. Keep your eye on the prize, which may also include make sure you do a needs analysis to find out what that prize is. So maybe there's two in one here. Don't forget your needs analysis, but also remember what the goals are that's a bonus gem within a gem i like that M. this is endless but we have to draw it to a close because it's time for learn, learn a, a word. word do you remember i mentioned a word earlier you mentioned steeple tell us about it M. well my first memory of steeple was that little rhyme that we made at school with you know you did the thing with your hands here's the church here's the steeple open the door, and here's the people. And I can't do it on this format because I'm doing things with my hands, which means there's lots of pointy fingers and steeple motions. I guess we'll put a video in the show notes so people can check that out. Oh, nice. Okay, that's good. (laughs) Probably not your hands, but somebody's. But that's how I learned what steeple was, because I made this little triangular shape with my hands. And And was it on top of the church? Yes, that's what I was coming to. I might have been getting to it a little bit circuitously. But yes, when you make your fingers into a little point, that is the steeple. It represents the steeple on top of the church. I don't know what the purpose of a steeple is, though, Gav, do you? It's simply described by Oxford English Dictionary as... A spire on top of a church tower or roof, M. So a spire is the same as a steeple? I guess it was so it was visible. If you needed to get to a church, you could see one on the horizon and go towards it. Maybe it points to heaven. Maybe it's good for weather vanes. I don't know, but it's an interesting word. I think that was enough for our followers to become inquisitive themselves about that particular word. Em, are there any other words associated with churches that you might want to teach your students just on the off chance? As we're on the topic and we're going to exploit the church theme, I'm going to say altar. The altar? Which is the bit at the back where you see the priest giving some kind of sermon, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It's like the focal point, isn't it, of Mm -hmm. the church? It's also where they do sacrifices because that goes together, doesn't it? Sacrificial altar. Oh, yeah, you're going in a bit of a different direction, but probably that's our historical reference. Pagan, I think, more, maybe. I don't know, but that is a collocation. Where people sit? Pews. Aha, and there are aisles? Between the pews. Okay. Well, there's only one aisle. Like when you're getting married, you walk down the aisle to the altar. That's what I'm looking for, which is also called the nave, that area. Yeah, that's the area. I think the altar is in the nave, perhaps. But your family and friends are sitting on the pews. So you're walking down the aisle towards the altar, which is in the nave. And also the church may be lit with some beautiful light from the... Uh Uh-huh, stained glass windows, Mm. often depicting... Beautiful pictures, people, events. Mm -hmm. Very true. Anything else? I think there's an organ playing. Usually, I'm thinking just weddings now, but yeah, there's (laughs) an organ that plays music, like a bit of a piano type thing. Nice. You've also got those people who sing. Choir. Mm -hmm. Very good word for pronunciation practice. Choir doesn't look like it sounds. Spelt. C-H-O-I-R. Very good. I think that area is also the chancel. And then at the very back of the church, you might find the A-P-S-E, pronounced. Apse. 
It is pronounced apps. That's the bit at the back. Right. These are the ones I'm not so sure about. Mm, I'm sure we could have an even more detailed description. But anyway, our learner word was staple. And I think you described it fairly well, Em. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. It was fun. So a big thank you to Issa for being our guest today. Don't forget to visit Issa's Instagram at Issa underscore English underscore lessons. And for all our newbie followers and newbie teachers out there, you're going to have a great time. It's a great job. It's a fabulous industry. And and it may be overwhelming and stressful, but I'm sure it will be worth it in the end. And it's all going to be better because you're in it. Well done, newbies. Go, newbies. M. see you next time. See you, Gav. 